You are listening to the new man beyond the macho jerk and the new age wimp. Your host is men's coach Trip Lanier. Can you imagine sitting down with your arch enemy to hear their story and have a few laughs? What's the difference between racism and prejudice? And do we really need to tiptoe around folks so that they don't get offended? W. Kamal Bell from the CNN show United Shades of America is here to discuss his experience with the KKK, political correctness, and what you can do so that we can all get along. Hello? Kamal, this is Trip Lanier. Hi, how's it going? It's going well. I appreciate you being able to take the time to talk today. No problem. Thanks, thanks for wanting to talk to me. Absolutely. I'm going to do a promo for your Showtime special in the United Shades of America in a voiceover. Is there anything else that you want me to promote? Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Also, my podcast, Denzel Washington's the Greatest Actor of All Time, period. That's not up for debate, is it? No, it's not. I mean, not as far as me and my co-hosts are concerned. We, we can debate it, but... <laughs> I love it. Kamal Bell, thanks so much for taking the time to talk today. I want to use our time to talk about what you call awkward conversations that initiate change. Let's start with the most awkward conversation I've seen in a while. You met a Klansman out in the middle of nowhere in the dark. And when that Klan guy walked out of the darkness in front of his pickup truck wearing those robes and that hood, I felt scared. And I'm a white guy that grew up in the South, and I was sitting in the safety of my own home. So I'm glad you're still here to talk with us today. Um, yes, yes. Most conversations aren't conversations at all. They're debates. They're, they're, we're, we're, we're fussing over who's right and who's wrong. We're talking over one another. There's no exchange of ideas. But on the United Shades of America, you're bringing a different approach when you choose to meet a Klansman out on a dark road. You're asking questions. What's, what's the thinking behind that? Uh, I mean, I've, you know, I... I, I'm old enough to remember Jerry Springer episodes where Klansmen threw chairs at, at audience members. <laughs> I, I, I remember seeing Geraldo Rivera get his nose broken on TV, but I think by a white supremacist. And I was like, I don't think that's the way that's going to work. Uh, and also, I think that for me, I'm really curious. Like, I'm just, by, I'm an only child, so I live in my head a lot. So by nature, I'm a curious person. And so for me, I'm like, I actually am curious. Like I'm wearing of the Klan you know, and worried about the Klan, although I live in Berkeley, so it's not really a big worry. <laughs> I'm more worried about the, the uh, if my kale is okay. But but as far as like the, but I also was just curious about how do how do you live this way in the 21st century? How do you how do you form these ideas in your head in the year 2016? I mean, in the 1920s and 30s. The Klan was a big political movement. So, you know, there's probably people in the Klan who weren't even that racist at that point. They're like, I'm just trying to be a part of the group. Right. But now you really have to make a big choice yeah. to put that robe on. Because even racist white people go, put the Klan robes too far. I believe I agree with him 100%. But I'm not wearing the robes. Right, right, right. Okay, got it. Well, you're a comedian. It's your job to be funny. But on the, on the show, you're not just going for laughs here. It seems like you're, you've got another aim with your humor. What's the impact of your humor in these awkward exchanges? Uh, I mean, I think the thing I know that if this is true of, of humor across the board is that if somebody's laughing at the things you say, then you know they're paying attention. And mm-hmm. they're, not, they're not caught up in what they're going to say next. They're not, they're not caught up in, in arguing with you. If you make somebody, I mean, you can stop an argument by making somebody laugh. Yeah. And so I know that if I'm getting those guys to laugh with me, and not, you know, they're not at me, but with me and laugh at themselves when I point out the hypocrisy. Yeah. And I know they're paying attention. And I know when, they, when, I leave, when I leave that some of them are still thinking about me. And now some of them are like, I can't stand it. I think he was tricky. The can't trust those black people. But some <laughs> people are like, huh. I mean, I know I'm supposed to be a white supreme, but that black guy seemed pretty cool. He seemed pretty cool. It's also, it seems like it's harder to hate one another if we're laughing together. If we find something on a common ground where we can enjoy it together, it's like, well, we can't be that far apart. Yeah, no, I mean, that's for me, it's like, I think that, you know, when you, when you connect with people and you sit down and actually take their story in and they take your story in, even if you disagree ideologically, you at least can re- re- leave more space for each other's humanity. Like, you don't, you know, you, I don't even care if they, I don't, I'm not trying to get those guys to love black people. I'm just trying to make sure that all the black people in the town can sort of live their lives, you know, safely and the way they want to. 
Yeah, it makes so you human. Into the Klansmen, yeah, if, you, if they run into the Klansmen at the Wind Dixie, it's just sort of like, it's just Bob the Klansman. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the Hoggly Woggly, isn't it? Or the Piggly, Piggly Wiggly? Uh, Piggly Wiggly, yeah. Piggly Wiggly, yeah. yeah. Piggly Wiggly, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I have people in Alabama, so it was Wind Dixie. It used to be Wind Dixie. That's there. right. Let's switch gears. Let's talk specifically about race. I know you're not a spokesman for Black America, but you've focused on race a lot in your work. <laughs> how, how do you define racism and prejudice? I want to get these terms. They get thrown around so much, but let's define yeah. it for this conversation. What does that mean? What does race and prejudice mean? Well, I, you know, and this is, I'm just defining things that have been defined by people way smarter than me who studied longer than me. So, like, I, this is not my definition, but by many uh, ethnic studies professors and activists and, and Cornell West type people, you know, racism is defined in that level as you have to, the oppression of the others that is supported by structural and institutional power. So, and also the, you can get, and the benefits you get from racism that is, that is in place by structural and institutional power. So for, therefore, the idea is that a black person can't be racist to a white person in America because a black person is not backed by structural and institutional power. Now, a black person can be prejudiced to a white person. They can say, I don't like you. I don't want to date you. I don't want you living near me. But the difference is, is that the white person has the power of the bank behind them to get a loan to move into whatever neighborhood they want to. Okay, one's more institutional and one's more personal. One's more like one's a, personal. Like, yeah, you can you can go. You, you know, you can you can sit on a, you can go on a bus and go. I don't want to sit next to the black guy or I don't want to sit next to the white guy. That's that's one thing. But the difference is, is that in most situations, if a white person says this black person did something wrong to me, the police will show up, the news will show, up, you know, and the, yeah. and the black person has to defend themselves against what could be a crazy charge. Okay. Whereas if a black person says this white person did something to me, they kick the black person off the bus. Like, it's just like, it's just like, right. And that's the, that's the whole sense of like being backed by institutional and structural power. And I get that it's confusing. I get that people, there's a certain, I mean, we toss the word racism around, around a lot and I've done this too. And sometimes I'll hear myself say racism. I mean, no, I mean, prejudice because it's just, we are so much more used to that word. But I think if we're going to move forward into the, further into the 21st century, we have to really, we have to really tease those two things apart. Yeah, that, that's helpful for me to understand that. Um, and what do you think we're moving towards? I mean, how will we know when we get there? What's the end game that you see? Uh, <laughs> I don't know, I was trying to think, uh, like... Like, like one day when we look up in this country, you're like, man, the, the, this, our president right now is a Latino lesbian. And our president before that was a disabled Chinese immigrant who was not born in this country because we stuck down that stupid law. And our president before that was, uh, was two gay guys who did it together. <laughs> they, were, they co-presidented, uh, you know, two, two white gay guys who were the co-presidents. I think when you get to the point where like one black president is supposed to be the end of everything you're supposed to it's it you're so, it's supposed to be a thing where everybody who's born in this country can aspire to have the most powerful office in the land and not aspire to it but actually have a legitimate shot at getting it yeah and it just turns out that still in this country it's still mostly going to you, you have a much better shot of being a dumb six foot tall reasonably good looking white guy to become the president than a super smart lesbian uh arab muslim Okay. <laughs> you know, like, you know, like woman, you know what I mean? Like this, like doesn't matter how doesn't matter how many degrees that Arab Muslim woman lesbian is, she to her chances of being the president of the United States of America are pretty much zero. Okay, so that's what I that's what I'm not to put it all in the presidency, but I'm saying that's the kind of thing. That's when you know you arrived when you're not when it's not notable that, that a new group gets to aspire to a new level of power. It's just no big deal. It's, it's yeah, no big it's deal. deal that, of, okay. It's no big deal. It's just I mean you know it's like you know my mom is in her 70s, you know, late 70s. It's, she, she came up with like, don't drink out of that drinking fountain. Go sit in the balcony where the black folks sit. You know what I mean? Mm. Now, black people can pretty much drink out of whatever drinking fountain they want. It's no big deal. But right. uh, unfortunately, that didn't come with like home loans and reparation checks and free college tuition. <laughs> like, it's just sort of like, so we, you know, we can't, we can't settle for the drinking fountain is all I'm saying. Okay. All right. Well, at the risk of oversimplifying things, the race conversation reminds me of, you know, pissed off neighbors, right? And there's this sense of injustice on both sides. I'm pissed, I'm hurt, I'm scared, and I need you to feel this too. I need you to, to really get why this sucks for me. Uh, we need to deal with this shit before we can even talk about getting along. Um, do you get a sense that we can really have peace and unity in this no big deal kind of stuff when there's such a strong sense of injustice felt on both sides? Do we have to like clean out this shit first before we can 
get along? Well, that's where the that's where the awkward conversations start, and you know that's where the and if you're having an awkward conversation and you're truly listening, and you're also really claiming your side of the conversation, not like I think a lot of times when white people get in conversations about racism in this country, they sort of go, "Well, I didn't own slaves," or "I never called a black person the word." They sort of get caught up in their own personal behavior and forgetting that history is an is a line. <laughs> it's not it's not a series of dots and dashes. It's a line. So if you are in this country, you're part of the history. Of this country and you have to claim your part in the history of this country and just the same way that like maybe a white person is ne- maybe the, maybe this fictional white person I'm thinking of has never said the n-word or didn't own slaves or, or has a black friend at work or whatever it is they also it, they also get to participate in white privilege and white supremacy which means if they walk into a bank and they say I would like a loan the bank is likely to give them the loan or they can also buy a house whenever the neighborhood they want to like all these things that they're not thinking about the way I've been talking about recently it's like a little bit white privilege is like being Clark Kent and secretly knowing you're Superman, but actually not wanting to be Superman. <laughs> like it's just like you know, like like when Clark Kent walks around in his glasses, he's still Superman. He doesn't look like Superman. And I'm saying white privilege is is that it's you you have you have the power of this thing, and you should use it. You should and you should be aware of it. And you should also try to use it for good. There's nothing wrong with white privilege in that sense if you can use it for a good thing. Okay, so acknowledge, hey, you know what, I'm white, uh, the, the cards are stacked in my favor, I don't have to act yep. like uh, that makes me a racist or anything, but just recognize that what you're saying is that the, the system is stacked in, in, in the favor yeah, of white and then, people. And then, and, then, and then do something good. Like, you know, like, like, you know when, uh, when, your, when your black friend comes into work and goes, man, something racist happened to me, go, what? Listen to the story? How can I help? Is there anything I can do? Do you need, my, do you need me to pull up, put on my red cape and my blue tights? And, like, you know, like, and I don't mean that. And in that sense of like, you know, like there's an organization, uh, Surge, S-U-R-J, which is, uh, it's, uh, I think it's showing up for racial justice. And it's a white, or it's an organization for white people who want to figure out ways to participate in racial justice. Because okay. as all white people said, I can't join Black Lives Matter. Well, maybe you can, maybe you can't. But also, it's important that you guys do the work on your own. You know, yeah. it's, it's not just supporting black organizations. It's actually figuring out your own ways to start organizations or be a part of organizations that can figure out ways that white privilege can actually help the thing and not hurt the thing. Okay. I, I, uh, I recently watched Patton Oswalt's bit about the LGBT movement, and he's basically talking about how people are so reactive about what is or what is not politically correct. Um, mm-hmm. I think the result is that we, we, we're afraid to engage in these conversations because we're scared to say the wrong thing. We, don't, we, we know if we don't get it perfect that we're going to be labeled a racist or a bigot or you know, be labeled as prejudiced. Um, our hearts might be in the right place, but there's still ignorance because we're criticizing instead of talking, connecting, and I think compassionately educating one another. Um, where does compassion for the other person come into this? Even if they're not getting it well, right. I think that's, that's, but that's where the awkwardness of the conversation comes in. That if you say... Uh, if you say the wrong word and somebody goes, you said the wrong word, that's this is what people have a hard time doing. Oh, did I? I didn't realize that. I'm sorry. I will never say that word again. I'm going to work on that. Can you help me figure out how to not say that word in the future? Can you give me some other words to say? <laughs> can you even that's, tell me like why that's the wrong word, right? Like instead of just yeah, telling can you tell me, me why that's the wrong, can you, can you yeah. help educate me? And here's the thing. The thing we have to realize is that not everybody has the time to do all that work with you. So sometimes you got to go do that work yourself. So sometimes you might be in a situation where you use the wrong word and somebody goes, I can't believe you said that. That's the wrong word. And then they just keep moving about their day. It's not really that person's job. They may want to stop and educate you, but then it becomes like, let me go home and Google that word. <laughs> like, I mean, you know, we don't, you don't always have to have a, a, a Yoda to lead you through the thing. I mean, it's helpful, but sometimes, you know, Luke only had Yoda because there was no Google. He couldn't look up the force. How do I do it on YouTube? Yeah. And so I feel like we have to be, we have to be actively working on this stuff. I, there's times all the time I go, like, I mean, I can't tell me times I've gone to like Wikipedia and go, LGBTQIAAQI. What are the rest of those letters for? <laughs> like, you know, yeah. now I could ask my my lesbian friend that, and she might go through with it. But she's also got two kids and a job, <laughs> so like I just go online and figure it out myself. And I think we have to be. I think sometimes if you say the wrong word and somebody calls you out for saying the wrong word, you just go, "Oops, I didn't know." But a lot of times people want to defend their right to use that thing and go, "Well, now you're just making me feel like I can't say anything." Right, and that's again white privilege and white supremacy. No, no, no. I'm just saying words change and evolve. And this is a word we can't say. I mean, we just talked about this yesterday. Like I remember when transsexual was a totally appropriate word. Yeah. Well, and it's not it's an, not I, I mean, is there it's a mailing, anymore. is there a mailing list where we can update it on these terms? And when they, when they, they go out of like, it's not cool. Like, Hey, just so you know, on Monday we stopped using this word cause I can't keep up with it. 
Well, here's the thing. There are lots of, but you have to sign up to lots of mailing lists. You got to sign up to the to Glad Gay and Lesbian Activism. I can't remember what else stands for. See, I don't know what that says. I'm going to Google that later. But G L A A D, right. and you got to go to Color Lines, which is a racial justice <laughs> website. <laughs> you gotta go, I mean, sounds like gotta, it's a full time job. The, the disability <laughs> plan. Yeah, being a good person is a full time job. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing that happens also is that you get engaged in conversations you never would have had that can actually be and meet people you never would have met and guess what they're fun people too the idea some people have the idea that that's all work well yeah sometimes living is work but you also get to meet people outside of your immediate social circle so like on my podcast my Denzel Washington podcast we review Denzel Washington what we call the bone collector and in the movie he plays a, a quadriplegic I'm not even sure I'm not, I'm, now I'm worried I'm saying the wrong word you just, I'm, 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 I'm already inside. getting emails from the people who yeah, were exactly. kind of pissed off but see here's the thing I'm just sort of like I, by saying, I'm not sure if I'm saying the right word, I'm sort of owning the fact that I'm making it about this. So, you know, that's the other thing I had to do is not be so confident. Just, I'm just going to say whatever word. So anyway, so we, I, we did the bone collector and it's about a guy who's disabled. And I was like, is he even doing a good job of this? I have no idea. <laughs> like, you know, like, I, I think he's the greatest actor of all time, period. But is this right? And so what did we do? We went out online and said, who would like to come on? Who from the disabled community would like to come on and talk to us about Denzel Washington and the bone collector? And we had this woman show up. It was Alice Wong. And she came on the podcast. And she was great. And she went through and she goes, he's basically like 1% disabled. He has all the stuff. He's really rich. <laughs> you know, he's, got, <laughs> he's got all the gadgets that most disabled people don't have. So he's not actually, it's not that he's doing a bad job, but they're really making it look like every disabled person gets access to all the gadgets. Yeah. And it was like, oh, good to know. I didn't know that. And you know what she was also, Alice Wong was? Hilarious. <laughs> yeah. It was just this thing where it's like, now I'm having a conversation where I'm getting smarter. We're having an awkward conversation. I'm owning my ignorance. She's allowing me to. We're creating space for building. And now, me and Alice Wong are friends on Twitter. She's always sending me stuff. It's fun. She t- she explained to me how, like, the $6 million, or Cyborg, who's a superhero, like, sort of like the $6 million man, is actually disabled. I was like, I never thought of like we're all robotic, uh, a superhero who's half man, half robot being disabled, but I guess he is. You right. know? So it's like all this stuff where your brain starts to open up, and that's fun to me. Yeah, well, I'm glad you're. I'm glad you're flipping it because you know you're creating a new context here, which is you know the old way is you're getting it wrong, you're screwing up. Nobody wants to hear that, and then they get defensive, and you're like, well, wait a second, if you just yeah. own your ignorance, and we're not supposed yeah. to have it figured out, then it opens up doors and say, look, I don't know everything. Let me go find this we out. Would, Let me go ask some questions. Yeah, you, I mean, we wouldn't have. We would still be living out in the field where naked you hitting rocks against other rocks trying to figure out what how to make fire. If somebody wasn't like, hey, I've been working on this fire thing. I don't really got it. Can you help me? Sure I'll help you. I mean, that's, that's all of human development is is people owning their ignorance and asking for help and working harder and not just getting frustrated and walking away. Well, I like that because I, I mean, I work with people for a living. I'm a coach. They hire me because they want to make some transformation in their business or their marriage or life. And I find that it's rare that just focusing on what's wrong or what's missing, that alone doesn't make a difference on their own. It's when they, when they can see a different perspective, when they shift the conversation to talk about solutions and taking responsibility and making better choices, that's when things begin to change. So, so much of our mm-hmm. attention like these days is on politics, but that doesn't mean we're actually talking about solutions to the problems that this country is okay. facing, right? Like, I'm aware that there's a big issue with climate change, but I'm not as aware of what I can do to actually make a difference. So I think we become tone deaf when all we hear are the problems and mm-hmm. the bitching and complaining. And we don't believe we can do anything to change it. Is there any overlap here when it comes to problems with race in this country? Do you think solutions could be talked about more? Well, I, well, for example, I mean, let's talk about the yes. I think that like when you talk about something like the Black Lives Matter movement, that was a movement that just on its name made lots of white people on the left side and the right side of the aisle feel awkward and uncomfortable. But what a lot of people did is, is try to shout down the Black Lives Matter movement with other slogans instead of actually engaging and going, well, that really makes you uncomfortable. What does that mean? <laughs> you know what? <laughs> people have a tendency in this country to think if they're uncomfortable, then the thing that's making them uncomfortable is wrong. That's true a lot of times. If somebody's touching your swimsuit area and you don't want them to, you should stop that. <laughs> Speak but up, right? sometimes it's it's sometimes it's just it's just you going, This is a new experience for me and it's making me feel feelings. Oh my goodness. Like if that's all and you should investigate those feelings. And, and, you know, and not be threatened by your feelings. And I think that's happened. It's easy to go to a place of just yelling about it at each other. And I'm not saying I'm anti-yelling. There's always a time to yell. But if, if that's always the place you go to, that every time you're on Twitter and you see something you don't like, instead of just emailing that person going, hey, I don't, I'm not sure I understand this. Could you explain to me? You go, you're wrong. I'm blah, 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 blah. 
but you're never going to get to another place and you're always going to live in the same small corner of the world you always live in. Even if you think you live in a big place or doing lots of things, you're always, you're making your corner, you're painting yourself into a corner instead of like trying to go, can somebody help me get out of this corner? Which is, I feel like I'm actively engaged. I mean, I live in the Bay area. So I'm every day. Something happens where I'm like, whoa, what was that? <laughs> Last night, somebody was bicycling down the street at midnight, blasting rap music on a bicycle off a of boombox. I'm like, what is that? What's going on there? <laughs> <You> know, like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's not even a popular song. <laughs> and, just, and, I don't, and instead of calling the cops or instead of like, you know, hey, get you burned, turn, I was just like, that's just... I, this is just living in the world. <laughs> like, this is just like, you know, this is just living in the world. It's yeah. not something, it's not the only part of the world I run is the part that is within three feet of my body. And with two kids, I don't even really run that part. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, I mean, what's working when it comes to race? What, what is healing? What's actually bringing people together? I get the, you know, the, the yelling and the bitching and the moaning, the problem focus is not as effective. The debating kind of thing isn't necessarily. So what is bringing people together? What's working? What are you, what are you seeing? I mean, that's the thing. I think that, like, I live in the Bay Area, so there's a lot of, you have to get Which is like, live, that's, that's the fucking moon, man. Like, I, I've, I've, I, know, I know that I'm I'm it's you. different there. I tell you. So, I, like, that's the thing that's good for me. I literally walk outside my door, and I'm already, you have to cross-pollinate. You have to do with the bees. You got to get some, some, some you got to go from one flower to the next flower to the next flower and take it back and make some honey. Yeah. You have to get outside of yourself. And I think that, literally, if it's like the next time something makes you uncomfortable, you look it up. You Google it. You go on YouTube. You, you spend a half hour <laughs> or five minutes looking into like, what is this thing that is making me uncomfortable? What is this thing that is challenging my reality? And realizing that your reality is just your reality. It's not the reality. And I think that there's a lot of that that happens. If you like, if you think about Twitter, if you're only following the people you like and agree with, you're going to hear the same things all the time. Right. I don't like that. Whereas if you follow somebody like this person makes me angry, but they seem to have a lot of followers and people seem to like what they say. I was going to follow them. I mean, I think that Twitter is a great place for, following for finding out what other people are saying that you would have never heard before. So if you, you know, if you're only following the people in your, who think like you, well, you're gonna have the same conversations, but there's, there's great ways to use social media to actually expand your horizons. It seems like what you're talking about here. We we started this conversation. And that's what I'm saying for people who don't live for people who don't live in Berkeley. Right. <laughs> like that's what you have to do. You got to turn you got to turn your Twitter into Berkeley. <laughs> right, got it. Well, it seems like what you're saying here is because we talked about racism. We talked about this institutional thing. We talk about this thing, uh, white privilege. These are these are faceless, right? They're 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 more they're beyond what I can do just personally on my own. But everything you've been talking about is is what I can do and what the listener can mm-hmm. do. Um, I mean, and, this conversation right. Now, now, like we didn't know each other like 20 minutes ago. <laughs> you know, you know, like, right. I didn't know what kind of conversation we were going to have. I, and I'm just trying to show up and do the best I can. And you're showing up and do the best you can. And we both walk away and go, huh. I mean, that's, this is the exact thing. And this is, a, this is the exact kind of conversation that has to be replicated because maybe you'll tell somebody else what we talked about. I'll tell somebody else what we talked about. And then we go, yeah, the guy said he was from the South, but he seemed pretty cool to me. <laughs> 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 and I'm making a joke. I, but you know what I'm saying? Like, that's, the, that's what happens. That's what happens. Oh, I, I just love that because most of the time I think we hear about this institutional stuff. It's it's so out there. It's on the news. We see terrible images about things that are happening in communities that are across the country. And it's like, shit, what can I do about it? Um, and I love that you're bringing it back to, no, this is what you do. You go talk to the people that are around you. If they're confused, you or mm-hmm. they, if there's something confounding and, about and that, you, you're and you do it respectfully. You do it respectfully. Right. Like you don't just sit down with black people you've never met before and go, tell me about blackness. Right. So that's what's great about online. You can actually do that work without intruding on somebody else's thing. Or, and you can actually go on Twitter and go, I mean, I've done this before. Hey, can somebody explain blah, blah, blah to me? And you just wait for the things to roll. <laughs> you just wait for, you know. Now, again, that comes from like following a lot of people and getting blah, 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 and sort of, or, but you can do that in life. Like instead of like, just to, you know, sort of ask for help. Yeah, I love that. that. We've got to get over ourselves. I think that, you know, this, this podcast is directed towards men and most guys have a really hard time admitting well, they just only want to see themselves as somebody who needs help or that could benefit from help. They're always trying to do it on their own. And so I love this. I get curious and ask. Don't assume that you've got it all figured out. Um, make room for other yeah. perspectives in your own. And it doesn't mean, I think there's another piece here, which is, doesn't mean that your perspective is going to get annihilated or is invalid no. just because somebody no. else brings their own. I think that's the part where on the cable news shows, we see people yelling back and forth because there's no space yeah. for that other person to have their viewpoint that exists alongside their, your own. Yeah. I mean, you can, ha- I mean, I feel like I say this all the time. You can be a born again, uh, Republican 
Tea Party uh, uh, white, like white small town conservative. But that shouldn't necessarily always affect my, my ability to hang my freak flag fly in my life. But you know what I'm saying? Okay. Like it shouldn't. We can have different opinions on this stuff, but but my opinion of you should not. I I'm not gonna. I shouldn't be able to go. I don't think you should have church in your life, and I don't think you should. Have, right. I don't think you should be able to have the uh, the Arbor Day festival you guys have every year. I'd be like, no, do your thing, <laughs> enjoy. But I also don't think you should then think. Well, here's how I think. I don't think you should be able to get to get married to that guy. <laughs> Like, what are you doing? You can hold your beliefs in your head, and you can and you can live by your beliefs. But I think we should all be able to do that as long as we're not uh, like I'm not going to believe all up in your house. Got it. it. Sounds like there's a thing of like, hey, look, I've got my preferences, I've got my beliefs, yes. um, but that's different than I'm going to impose them on you. Yes, yeah. That that the country was literally founded on the opposite of that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now there was a lot of screwed up ways, ways, ways why the country was founded, but the Puritans came over here to, for religious freedom. But that meant for everybody, not right. just for their not just religion. for their group. Well, let's talk. I want to bottom line, bottom line it because we we've circled around some of this stuff today. But I'm imagining the guy that's out there. He's in the treadmill right now. Or he's uh, you know stuck in traffic. <laughs> let's say he's avoiding an awkward conversation with someone who's different than himself. It could be about anything, not just about race. So what can mm-hmm. he do to mm-hmm. open up that channel? Maybe he does, maybe he's not on Twitter. Who knows? But what could he op- do to open up that channel of communication and possibly initiate a positive change? I think you have to reach out. You have to find, like if there's somebody out there that you feel like I really would like to figure out how to do this. You have to be. You have to figure out an appropriate way to reach out. And I can't tell you how what's appropriate for who you're. You know your own relationship in your life. But some people it's a text. Some people it's a phone call. Some people it's an email. Some people it's a hey, you want to go out to lunch today? Like it's it's a, you have you have to know what the relationship is that's in your life. Mm-hmm. And then whatever that awkward thing is, I would open the conversation up with owning your ignorance. Look. I know I don't know what I'm talking about. I know I don't know a lot about this. I know that in the past I have offended you because of this. I don't know exactly what I, what went wrong or what went down or da da da. And the more you own your ignorance, the more the other person will open up to go. Okay, I I can be I, I more likely. I mean, it depends on what the thing is. So I feel like this is not a salve for everything. But the, if you own your part in it, then the other person will likely own some of their part in it. And also, it's also about really looking at yourself and going, is this my issue or is this their issue? And sometimes. People go, for example, you got offended when I said that thing that you were offended by, and then you go, so you need to not be offended. That's not actually how that works. But <laughs> you need to go, yeah. like, you know, you you have to own the fact that this is actually if somebody's offended by something you did or said, you then have to ask yourself, do I want this person in my life? And if the answer is no, then keep moving. There's plenty of people on Twitter offended by things I say, and I go, well, that's just how it's going to be. Yeah. But if there's somebody I want in my life, then I have to feel like I've got to rebuild this bridge. And so you have to decide how is it, how important is it that this person is in your life? And if it's not important, then let them go. But if it's somebody you're like, well, I work with them every day, or it's my mom, or it's my friend, or it's this guy that I want to be friends with, or it's this person I want to date, then you got to own your ignorance. You got to and, and sit in the awkwardness and get practice learning. How, people, the other thing people need to learn to do is the value of learning how to shut the fuck up. Like you got to be able to sit there. Like <laughs> when you go, I did something wrong, and I want to have a conversation with you. Then you got to let the person talk. And it's not about waiting for their your turn to talk. It's about actually letting them talk and stewing in the awkwardness. Got it. I, I'm so glad you brought this up because I don't want to. I don't want to tiptoe around people. You know, I want to be able to have that conversation. I mean, it seems impossible to be a comedian these days because you know it, it's it's like the end of the world if somebody gets offended. Um, and you're a guy that's see, actively. What's about that? Is that yeah, that it, 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 it's the, we comedians. Are, there's like a sea change happening now, right now. Like anybody at any time can tweet out your joke and send it to the world. But then the comedians have to own their space. And there are comics who are, I'm an offensive comic. That's what I do. So therefore, I'm going to, you, you are going to be offended by what I do. But some comics that thing were like, they're not even really trying to be offensive when they do offend people. It becomes a problem. They're like, I didn't even know. But then they hide behind like, well, that's your problem. Well, either you want to be offensive or you don't. Like, I, there's certainly jokes in my act that people think are offensive. But I'm like, yeah, that joke was meant to be offensive. Okay. And there's some jokes where people go, I was offended by that. And I go, Oh, you're right. I said the wrong word. <laughs> like, Interesting. I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> like, so I think sometimes comedians can be sort of, and also here's the other thing about that comic thing. It only affects the comics who have jobs, other jobs. Like the reason why, uh, it affected like Tracy Morgan is because he actually had a job on NBC. You know, who mm. never apologizes cat Williams. Why? Cause he doesn't work for anybody but other than cat Williams. Right. Right. 
Well, I, I, that's that's a that's a whole other complex issue we could get into, um, and, yeah. and it's so powerful. But I, I just love this. Like, let's let's stop tiptoeing around each other and engage one another. Uh, let's have these conversations instead of uh, you offended me, no, you offended me, and then we're at that gridlock mm-hmm. again. So, um, and, uh, but and, uh, like, and when you say don't tiptoe around each other, I do want to make it clear that you have to, however you enter in this conversation, you got to be respectful. And sometimes yes. it may be being respectful is it getting up on your tiptoes, but but you definitely yeah. have to figure out a way to respectfully engage with whoever these people are. I, I think it's just, I'm tired of treating people like they're fragile. I think that's what it is. Like <laughs> when I'm around my friends, like I know we can, we can hit each other mm-hmm. from time to time, but there's love there. There's, there's a respect mm-hmm. there. Yeah. There's a, there's a years of relationship that's been built. Up yeah. Over time that, yeah. And I think that you can't all eventually treat the world like, like they went to college with you. <laughs> exactly. But we but I also think it helps to not, not see people as fragile. Um, I think that's yeah. the part, like when we believe that people are powerless or that they're fragile, then they they tend to respond that way. So um, I want to challenge myself. I want to challenge other people. Like, no, you're you're yeah. strong. We can we can have this conversation and be respectful yeah. at the same time. There we go. There we go. All yeah. right, W. Kamal Bell. Thanks so much for talking today, man. I love what you're doing in the world, and uh, you're challenging people. You're challenging my thinking, and uh, please keep doing it. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. Good talking to you. Okay, buddy. Take care. Be sure to check out Kamal Bell on the United Shades of America, which airs on CNN, and also listen to his podcast entitled Denzel Washington is the Greatest Actor of All Time, period. If these interviews are helping you, then please visit The New Man on iTunes and leave us a positive review so others can discover the show more easily. Thanks for listening.